Hello, everybody. I want to start by saying a massive thank you to all of you supporting the show on Patreon. It is so important. If you haven't heard yet, between now and the end of the year, we are on a campaign for your support to help us make Techno sustainable for 2024 and beyond. We are an independent show and it's taken us six years to get where we are now through huge amounts of time given for the love of what we do. As well as myself, we have two producers running things behind the scenes, two part-time editors, a videographer and some fantastic interns. The aim of this campaign is to be able to pay everyone fairly for their time making Take Notes what it is. So if Take Notes is something you want to see continue, please consider supporting us on our Patreon. There are options to donate monthly and enjoy all the perks of being a subscriber, or you can make a one-off donation via our Patreon store. Perks include access to full-length video episodes, magazine-style gear lists, and the opportunity to ask questions for upcoming guests. I'll be giving more of the details in the ad breaks, but you can also find out for yourself at patreon.com forward slash tape notes. If you are one of the many inspired or entertained by tape notes, please join those already supporting the show and allow us to keep going and keep getting better. Thank you. And now on with the show. Hello and welcome to Tape Notes, the podcast that looks behind the scenes at the magic of recording and producing music. Every episode we'll be reuniting an artist and producer and talking through some of the highlights from their collaboration in the studio. So join us as we lift the lid on the creative process and the inner workings of music production to see what lies beneath. Hello, I'm John Kennedy, and joining me for this episode of Tape Notes are Fall Out Boy, with producer Neil Avron to talk about how they wrote, recorded, and produced the album So Much for Stardust. Fall Out Boy are a pop rock band from Illinois, formed of vocalist and guitarist Patrick Stump, guitarist Joe Troman, drummer Andy Hurley, and bassist Pete Wentz. With roots in the early 2000s hardcore punk circuit in Chicago, the early days of Fall Out Boy came when Pete and Joe decided to venture into the realms of pop punk. After recruiting Patrick and Andy, the group quickly became a prominent part of the local scene. Whilst their debut album, Take This To Your Grave, released in 2003, gained underground acclaim, it was 2005's From Under The Cork Tree with producer Neil Avron that catapulted them into mainstream success, featuring smash hit singles including Dance Dance and Sugar We're Going Down. Their first number one record came in 2007, as well as topping the charts, Infinity on High gained the band a loyal following and saw them solidify their presence as major innovators across both the US and international rock scene. Throughout the 2010s, the band began to venture into different territories, incorporating elements of R&B and electropop. But in 2023, they returned to pop-punk heavyweight label fueled by Rahman, revisiting the roots of their sound with their eighth studio album, So Much for Stardust. Neil Avron is an American record producer, mixer, and musician. Neil began his musical journey as a jazz trumpet player and graduated with a music engineering degree from the Frost School of Music in Miami. Gaining experience in the prestigious studios Sunset Sound and Criteria, he refined his skills learning from some of the top engineers and producers of the day. Since his debut as a producer on 1997's So Much for the Afterglow by Everclear, Neil has shared his talents with artists including 21 Pilots, Walk the Moon, 30 Seconds to Mars, and Blink-182. In 2010, he created headlines when he worked on albums that debuted at number one on the Billboard charts for three consecutive weeks. Disturbed's Asylum, Linkin Park's A Thousand Sons, and Sarah Bareilles' Kaleidoscope Heart. For his production work with Sarah, he also received a Grammy nomination. Having collaborated with Fall Out Boy on three of their earlier albums, from Under the Cork Tree, Infinity on High and Folie à Deux, in 2022 they reunited, setting to work on So Much for Stardust. Today I'm at home in Morden, South London, and I'm joined by Patrick and Neil from their respective homes across America. And what better way to start the conversation than by hearing something from the record? This is Hold Me Like a Grudge.
It is Hold Me Like a Grudge. It is Fallout Boy from the album So Much for Stardust. And I'm very pleased to say that I have Patrick Stump from Fallout Boy connected to me on the west coast of the United States. Hello, Patrick. How's it going? Very good, thank you. And I also have Neil Avron, uh, the producer of the album, connected to me from the east coast of the United States. Hello, Neil. Hello, John. It's great to have you both here. Now, we're here to talk about how you made and recorded the album so much for stardust and the the first song we're going to listen to is love from the other side but before we do that i wondered what you wanted to do with this new record because there was a little bit of a gap between this album and the last album and there was also a gap between the last time you'd worked with neil mm -hmm. as well yeah well it's weird we're in a we're a weird band in a weird place you know i feel like we've always kind of had trouble fitting into anything weirdly you know what i mean it, it, it's like we we were part of this whole emo thing but we kind of sat outside of it because you know we were more into hip-hop and r&b than the other emo, emo kids or whatever and then you know but then that we weren't really a pop band exactly you know if you if you they would put us on pop radio shows and we'd go in and play you know and it comparatively it was like slayer was playing but of course you know <laughs> we're like a we're still a pop band it's just we, we've always had a difficulty of like landing in a in a place and because of that it's made it difficult to find you know people to work with it's also found it made it difficult to find um direction sometimes because you know you may be inspired by something that doesn't really fit, you know? Um, and so that was one of the things that we tried for a long time in the gap there, was trying to figure out what we were gonna do. And we experimented with a lot of things. We experimented with some reggae and we experimented with some um, 90s, like kind of shoegaze stuff. We experimented with some more hardcore influence things and whatever. Um, I always bring R&B influence things as well. But uh, it kind of went back and forth and we had talked to a few producers and frankly, I wasn't very interested. <laughs> I was kind of not feeling good about it. I didn't feel like we had a good direction or anything. And um, I kind of put my foot down and I was like, I would love to work with Neil again. Yeah. Well, I mean, Neil, you, you'd worked on three Fallout Boy albums before. So clearly you and the band had a great relationship and it was one that you knew worked. So maybe that was one of the reasons why you... Patrick thought, you know what? We know Neil. We like Neil. We work well with Neil. Why don't we <laughs> give Neil a call? And then were you surprised to get a call, Neil? A little bit. I, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I'd always hoped that I'd work with them again. Uh, you know, working with a band and getting a chance to work on multiple records with a band is always, for me, a feather in my cap. I love working on multiple records, seeing the band grow and having our relationship grow in the music. I think that. Originally, I think their manager called me to say, hey, I know you've been only mixing pretty much, but are you interested in producing again? And and that kind of started the ball rolling. And then Patrick and I got on a conversation as well. And I think it kind of really started like, hey, let's do a few songs together and see how everybody's feeling. And uh, it's, you know, it seemed in my mind and obviously from them that things were going in a positive direction. So it was, uh, it, we just continued on and soldiered on until we finished the record, essentially. Yeah. And when you came to record it, did you go to one place specifically and just stay there for a month and, and do it that way? Or was it more piecemeal? What was the approach? We spent most of it in Neil's house. <laughs> yeah. Really, the, the approach is, you know, essentially, you know, Patrick would come with pretty fully formed recordings and demos of the songs that were, you know, he typically writes in this interesting way where he writes like, here's an intro, a verse, pre-chorus, chorus kind of a thing. And here's the song. Here's the, the shell of the song. And a lot of it's pretty well formed. And instead of him writing the whole thing, he just wants to make sure everybody's digging where the song is at. And so he sent those to me and we had some conversations about these are the ones I, you know, I think we should start with or believe in. And and so we would spend time at uh, my studio and going through and, and working up arrangements and stuff like that. So that's really how it started for each song, essentially. And we just kept going until we had enough songs for a record. And so was that just the two of you or was that the rest of the band as well? For a lot of it was just the two of us, I'd say. Yeah. So we, we would call everybody else in, but it was kind of one of those things where 
at that stage, we were kind of, if I remember right, we were just sort of pulling together ideas, right? You know, like we, at like the end of the day, everybody would come in and listen, I think, right? The, at the very beginning, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I think everybody had a, a piece either, you know, I think we would send some stuff to Joe or Pete would come in to take a listen. And, you know, there were some failed attempts at a couple songs early on that we were like, oh, this is cool. And then we dig into it. And then by the time we kind of got a fully formed idea, we're like, no, this is not really a song that belongs on the album. Well, the opening song on the album is the first song we're going to listen to today and have a look at, and it's Love From The Other Side. So I think maybe we should start digging into that. But before we get digging into it, we're going to hear the mastered version, the final version that everybody knows and loves. So if you're able to play that, Neil, that would be great. All right, here we go. So it is Love From The Other Side, just a little taste of the opening song to the album, So Much For Stardust, and there's so much going on there, it's intriguing to know where to start, because <laughs> it starts in one way and then goes off in a different way, but you managed to bring those two worlds together so well. And you were saying, Neil, that in many instances, Patrick turns up with a demo that is, is pretty realized in terms of the ingredients that are going to be in a song. So. Am I thinking that all those string parts and all those delicate uh, glissandos are, are, are all there on the demo? Or is that something that gets thought about afterwards? One of the demos. Well, actually, I, Neil and I were talking about this. <laughs> we, 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 we'd love to play you uh, some versions. Uh, but so the background of this song, um, you know, as we were trying to kind of crack the code of what we were going to do with this album, one of the things that was very difficult was, so, you know, um, for a lot of people, if they don't know, you know, I tend to write most of the music and then Pete, our bass player, tends to write most of the lyrics. And uh, as a function of that, you know, I'm not writing the lyrics, but I do have a lot of control over how they get used. And over the course of the previous couple records, I had gotten, <laughs> I don't know why, I gotten obsessed with streamlining his lyrics in choruses to be a little bit like, Pete is very wordy. He has these ideas that, are, that take up a lot of space, you know. And I felt like, for whatever reason, I had been, you know, I don't know, just going back through 70s records and, and thinking about the simplicity of, some, of certain lyrical concepts and, like, kind of aiming for that. And uh, our manager sat me down at a lunch, and he was like, he's like, hey, don't do that. <laughs> um, he said to me, he's like, you used to ramble. You guys used to ramble a little bit. Why don't you ramble? And I was like, I don't, okay, you know. So... This was the first song I wrote after that conversation. I went back and um, it's kind of stream of consciousness in terms of the way that I just followed the lyrics. But I was also playing with a lot of things that, you know, I was like, we haven't worked with Neil in a long time. Um, you know, we're, we're 22 years in as a band. You know, how, many, how, many, how much longer do you get to put out records and have anyone care about them? Um, and so I was like, uh, let's. I want to try a bunch of the things that we never got to try. So the meat of the song from once the band starts. So before, after the, we'll we'll deal with the orchestral section later. But once the band starts, that pretty much is 
was established right away. And it was established you know, in my first demo as a thing of like, I kind of just followed whatever I was feeling, you know, and, and um, basically a lot of these things in this song were things that you know, years of, of working in pop music had kind of scared me off of doing, you know, once we get to the chorus, that's not what you do in a pop song is, you know, a very long, I mean, it's a, it's essentially a paragraph chorus, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but then once I found that lyric of pizza, every, every lover's got a little dagger in their hand. I was like, that just, it all tied together. And it was really funny. I was demoing it and I remember, de- you know, singing that line and, and eagerly, uh, emailing Neil, like, listen to this, you know? <laughs> wow. That sounds amazing. So, I mean, are you able to share any of, of that? Well, before we do, I also want to point out a caveat that Neil reminded me of. I totally forgot, but my very first iteration, because, you know, Fall Out Boy doesn't get to do, just as a function of, I think, the way we came up, we don't really tend to do a lot of fun guitar stuff. So I really wanted to do something guitar present. So I don't know, Neil, if you want to play my first pass. Sure. I'll play just uh, a little bit of the intro, essentially. Kind of fretting. So a very different intro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, instantly, you know, I, I played it for the band, I played it for Neil, I played it for management, and unanimously everyone was like, we love it, except the intro, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, okay, uh, you know, um, no problem. And then I was like, well, what else did I want to do? Uh, what else was I have I always wanted to do? And one of the things was that the last time Neil and I worked together, on an album was uh, Foley I Do, which was kind of a, a very weird record for the band. And I don't know, ha- fits in this very weird place in our history. And one of the things that's very strange, you know, Neil and I, I think, lost most of the demos for that record. But there was, as weird as that record is, as the finished record is, the demos were e- were even weirder. And there was, it was so expansive and strange. It was practically psychedelic at times, just really... There were there were moments on on some of those demos that felt more like a Herbie Hancock record than a Fall Out Boy record. So uh, there was a thing that I wanted to get back to of kind of that experimentation, because that was something that was really fun about working with Neil in the the old days, was that we um, we would do studio stuff, you know, in a way that a lot of bands that I know just didn't, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we didn't for we hadn't since we worked with Neil where we would, you know, spend hours trying to dial in a, you know, synth clap delay, you know, or whatever. And, you know, but I mean, all hardware stuff and, you know, placing mics in in weird ways to have strange effects and just... We went, just, we went on a shopping spree yeah. and, and uh, Patrick bought like this old PA system that we set up. I don't know if you remember that. Mm-hmm. And we were using that and we were sending tons of stuff through that. And, and yeah, it was a lot of experimentation. It was very open to experimentation. And I was like, okay, so now we've got the meat of a song. How do we get into it? How do we start a record? Because that was the other thing is that by this point, I had felt like we had had the beginnings of a record, but we didn't have an opening. And I really love openings of albums, you know. I, I think I've been trying to write my Baba O'Reilly, you know, for my whole life. You know, that's like the way I see a record starting, right? And uh, so I was like, okay, one thing that I always wanted to do and I tried on Foley and it never happened was a piano phase. Uh, You know, I guess Steve Reich piano phase where you have a a loop, a looped phrase that's playing at the same time in multiple different tempos. So it started from that. I, I played this one piano line four times at different speeds and then... I took those and I, and I looped them for, you know, 20 minutes or whatever. And, you know, this isn't uh, an avant-garde record, so I don't get to just put out 20 minutes of, of piano phase. But so, so to, to, to kind of 
bridge the gap there that I listened through to find like a, a couple bars that I thought were really exciting and kind of transitioned between the beginning and that. So if you listen, the piano starts out and it's all kind of in the same tempo. And then gradually the four of them start to, you know, cascade and get all, you know, muddled. And then it transitions into what sounds like delay. It's, it is four different performances of it at different speeds. And then the kind of drama of the, the orchestral section kind of built around that. Very interesting. I mean, I think we need to hear some of these pianos then, if possible. Yeah. I mean, do, you did a demo of that and then yeah. redid it? Or was the demo kind of strong enough that you just went with that? No, we, re we actually, on this record, I think we really didn't keep much of any of the demo stuff. You know, and my demos were pretty decent. Um, but then Neil was like, yeah, but I know Jerry Hay. <laughs> so, um, you know. So, yeah, I can play a little bit of the, just the piano so you can kind of hear where it, how it evolves. That would be great. So... This builds to four pianos. So it is four pianos. They're all in there. It's always it's always four pianos. So around here, I'm jumping ahead to to a much further section of it. So, but you know, imagine I'm playing the same line. I'm playing a bar of the same line at whatever BPMs this is. If it's I don't remember, but if I'm playing a piano line at 120 and then I play the same line at 121 and then I play the same line at 122 and, and the same line at 123 and I start them at the same time, for the first few bars, they'll be relatively in sync, right? And it'll sound kind of normal. By the end of the second bar, you'll start to notice some of them are lagging, right? And by the fourth bar, it's like, blah, 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 you hear a lot of flams and whatever. By the you know, 17th bar, you start to get these really cacophonous, strange sounds. There are these moments in there. It's really hypnotic. It does all these weird sonic, almost illusions and things where you hear sounds that aren't there and stuff. You hear, you know, almost drum sounds and things, or, or you hear bass frequencies that aren't there. It just, it's just resonating on all these things. And then it goes on to something else. So I always loved phases as a thing. I always found them very fascinating. So I was like, I want to, I would kill to have one on a Fall Out Boy record. And this was my little way of getting it on there. <laughs> yeah. And who is playing all of those? So uh, that is me. That's Patrick. So, oh, no. Patrick, you're playing. Yeah, I'm playing the piano there. Yeah. <laughs> so in a parallel universe, there is a Steve Reich, uh, Patrick Stump album yeah. that could come out. I mean, and, and, you know, could be performed, you know, with four different pianists. Yeah. Maybe one of these days when I'm, um, when my voice is too haggard for um, rock shows, you know, that'll be where I go. <laughs> and so having got this idea and set it up, then, you know, you, you try to bring in all this other stuff. So you, you want to bring in orchestration. You also want to bring in the band. Mm -hmm. How easy was that plan? That was the easy part. So I've been scoring film and TV for the past eight or nine years. So I've been dealing with orchestras and um, writing for orchestras and you know, I want some drama. I want because that's the thing is that when I look back at our our records, our best ones start off with a kind of sense of melodrama for some reason. You know, it's just part of our our milieu, part of our vibe, I guess, right? And I was like, okay, well, you know, now this is us, twenty two years in. What does that drama sound like now? You know, if you get the sophistication of you know all the stuff that we've learned, all the all the abilities that we've attained. You know, also not for nothing. You know, it's not like Neil is frozen in place either. Neil was already a fantastic producer, but now he's... Because when the last record we did was, um, what was it, 2008? I mean, he's that many years wiser as well. So, like, I was like, we can push this so much farther, you know? So what should we listen to next that would well, help explain what you did? So maybe we could play... Neil, do we have the multi-tracks of the demo orchestra? And we can play that kind of against the, the live orchestra stuff? I don't have the multi-tracks of the demo, but I do, I mean, I have your original demo or the la the okay. latest version of the demo. Yeah, with the, okay, so we can play that and you can kind of see to what degree I, bu I built up the orchestra. Mm -hmm. 
And oh, we took that out. We didn't like that uh, low bass note. But uh, yeah, so I'm mostly in contact instruments. Um, I tend to play everything individually. So like that one trumpet line was one pass of me playing it. All you know, the cello is one pass. The bass is one pass. I'm not doing like a synth pad. I kind of. You can see it's pretty. It's pretty close to what we what we hear in the, in the yeah. finished. And uh, then when we went in to record it, uh, we recorded it twice. There's two layers of in the orchestra. Um, we knew that we were going to have strings and, and a proper orchestra. And so we went to um, Angel in, in London and, uh, you know, recorded that. And it was fantastic. I mean, astounding the way it sounded. It's, a be it's by the way, to toot Patrick's horn, this arrangement is incredible. And I do, I do think it's worth listening to the whole thing in solo, the strings and the horns together, just to get an idea of all the voice leading and harmony that he's doing. It's really, it's pretty That's amazing. Cool. And, and so we did that with an orchestra, but then we also had this, um, we had worked with Jerry Hay, uh, and his horns, the horn section on infinity and on, um, Folia Deux, just a spectacular arranger and a hell of a trumpet player though. He doesn't play as much anymore. And, um, so we had, we had some sections on the record that were more like pop horns. And, uh, so we had, you know, contracted him to do those. Well, he shows up and he was like, you know, I went, I took the liberty of also doing, of also arranging the, the orchestra stuff too. Now he had four players, right? But those four players were extraordinary. I mean, we're like other level. There's a trombone player, Bill Reichenbach, and um, a, a trumpet player, uh, Wayne Bergeron. So these four guys, in addition to the orchestra that we had, I mean, it went, it, it was like this to this. It was extraordinary. There was a, there was a trumpet line, I think it was playing on the left channel. Now I, like I said, I'm doing this all in contact. A function of that is, you know, I'm a composer, but I, it's not like I've spent decades in, you know, in front of an orchestra or, you know, I didn't go to conservatory. I don't have committed to memory my, you know, the, the comfortable ranges for players. I, I know what they physically, you know, what's possible um, so there's a trumpet line that I had played on the synth and it was pushing it. It was pretty high. And I was like, the synth is fine. I'm not really expecting anybody to play that. That's a, it's practically a, um, it was kind of out of human performance and Wayne did it <laughs> like without trying. And it was one of those things where everybody in the room was like shocked and, you know, Wayne just kind of, you know, yeah, <laughs> he just kind of nodded like, yeah, I can do that. And like I said, the orchestra at Angel was already excellent. But then adding those guys in was just like, it was one of the coolest recording sessions I've ever done. <laughs> May, are we able to hear that, that trumpet yeah, line? Yeah, do we have just... Um, I, th I think so. That was the note. And to crescendo on it. I mean, that's, yeah, that's it's hard just stuff. very hard brass playing. Amazing. And what next? Because then, of course, I mean, the band, you know, you have it all set up for the band to kick in. When did you record them? You know, did you record them after you'd got all the orchestra sorted or beforehand? The, the band, I believe, was first. Yeah, I think we, we first. recorded right. the, you know, essentially we recorded, you know, from when the band enters all the way to the end of the song. I mean, Patrick had already had the demo version of the intro. And then I think we recorded, I believe we recorded the piano intro. Mm -hmm. Then the orchestra came last, pretty much. Um, That's right. We went to a studio in Seattle and did the piano and Andy, I think. 
Is that right? I, I actually think the drums for this were done in LA. We definitely did okay. the piano. I don't remember what else we did for this song. Yeah. But that, that was one of the weird things was we jumped around a lot in making this record. Um, you know, so there's a lot of it that was recorded on any given song. There's stuff that was recorded in, we did a, a session in Seattle. We did a session in a handful of sessions in Los Angeles and we did a lot of stuff at Neil's house. So a lot of the guitars were recorded at Neil's house, but yeah, we did most of the band stuff first, I think. Yep. It would be good if we could build up through the track maybe and introduce all these mm -hmm. different elements, you know, as they work together. Sure. So we had, I can solo a few of the instruments. So we had the, the drums, kind of rock roomy drums. I love that kick. And then we got bass. One of the things on the intro, I know I added some reverb to the guitar stabs just to give them a little length little room and then the guitar octave part that um, Joe played really cool contrary motion going on there between the guitars the, the, the octave guitar is coming down the scale and the and the rhythms are going up. And the piano, we know what the piano is doing. We went through that. And I mean, that's really all that's playing. It sounds big uh, for that intro, but that's kind of everything. Between that and the orchestra, there's a lot. If you're listening to the guitar and the orchestra, there, there's a lot of information. And then in the verse, uh, I think we're coming down to a single guitar here. Oh, there's also an acoustic doubling it. I don't remember how we did that electric, what we did with it, because I feel like that was another one that we did a lot of fun pedal stuff. But yeah, I don't, I don't have remember. anything listed for the pedal, but I know it was a Strat going through an mm -hmm. orange amp. Yeah, it was One of the things strat, I do yeah. I do recall is we had we had a separate send for the riff for those to have if you listen to just the riff here. So we had those little reverb splashes to accent those high notes and it kind of brought it in stereo and a little bit more otherworldly. But um, that was that between that and and Patrick's vocal that really just drives that first verse. And then the band comes back in with the, the bass for this back half. And that kick just fills in so much space the meat of it. That's the line I was talking about that was kind of served as a, uh, as a harmony to the uh, vocal. Yeah. Things a little bit lonely or me loose Like a kid playing pretending his father's suit Yeah, that's great. Yeah. It sounds amazing hearing all those different parts because the interesting thing is when you listen to the album, Love From The Other Side really sets it up in a nice way because on the one hand, you kind of get a little bit of the orchestra. You think, okay, there's kind of this spectrum of sound on this new record. But at the same time, it kicks in and it really rocks. You know, it's it's kind of straight ahead. And so you're, you're kind of told that to expect a bit of rocking out this time round. Right. And despite all the information that we're processing, somehow it cuts through. So I think it's quite easy to grasp as a listener, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that's what I was hoping for. I, I kind of wanted to do, I, I guess when I talk about album intros, I think some of the best ones I see almost as overtures, you know, it sets the tone for the whole record, you know, 
And yeah, ideally you're giving people a little bit of an element of what's going to be, what to expect from the whole album. This is the thing is I care about albums still. You know, I feel like there's been, you know, over the course of as, um, you know, culture's kind of moved on from, you know, to streaming and things like that, which is awesome too. There's interesting challenges as an artist there. But at the end of the day, I really still want to make an album. You know, that's a whole art piece to me. And, um, you know, so I wanted exactly what you said, you know, to to kind of give people a hint of what to expect, I guess. Yeah. And it, and it works really well as an album because there are ups and downs. There are different things to to attract our attention. And, and you kind of take us on on a little journey and you you simplify things at times so that we have a, a, a reprieve in a way from all the information that we're getting and, and you kind of reset us a couple of times. I mean, particularly in the middle with the pink seashell mm-hmm. track, you know, that kind of stops everything for a moment and then we go back in. Um, there's so much to talk about, so much to listen to. So we should maybe move on from Love from the awesome. Other Side unless there's still some elements that we you think we should hear. Yeah, I mean, I'd say the only other thing to note in this song, well, not only, but uh, I'd say, you know, the bridge is a really cool breakdown, uh, piano, vocal, string moment. And then I think the other thing is the way the last chorus is kind of set up as essentially three different versions of the kind of chorus. And it's kind of like the main big chorus. And then it goes into this kind of double time feel on the snare drum chorus. And then back into like this halftime version of it of the intro and it's just it it really is an epic it makes for an epic closing of like patrick says the overture yeah well i mean if you, maybe we should hear that yeah i then. think it, i think it's worth yeah. he- hearing that and when you're composing these patrick are you do you compose in little sections and then put them all together or are, are you thinking in terms of a whole so kind of what neil was talking about earlier about the way i demo where i tend to I want to get the story beat of like where we start and then up through the first chorus, right? Is I feel like that's the hardest part of writing a song if you're using, if you're utilizing like a pop song format where there's going to be a verse and a pre chorus and a chorus. I feel like that part has to make sense before you can move on. And so when I demo, I only demo up to that first chorus. And then it's kind of, then it's the fun part, really. Then I get to figure out, you know, what's going to be different about this verse and what's going to be different about this pre-chorus and how is the transition going to be different or what in what way am I going to read something from the lyric that, you know, you want to reference musically or whatever. And then the bridge, uh, the bridge is often where I'm the most free form, where I'm, where I'm kind of, I'm really just playing, you know, I get to play around on bridges. And this was one of those where in the studio, I think we had recorded vocals for most of the song. Because I remember we were basically planning on knocking out as much vocals as we could get while we were there. And so it was like, well, maybe, and then we'll track the bridge when we figure out a bridge. But I just sat down at the piano and wrote it, you know, yeah. um, like on the spot. There's something about that that like, that's like, bridges are my favorite thing to write because that's where I get to just play. You know, I get to have fun. Well, yeah, once the, once the band came in, it, it's a pretty long song. Once the band came in, it was pretty rocking and... By the time the bridge comes around, you're ready for a little relief. And I think this bridge kind of provides it. Yeah, it might be nice to hear some of the strings isolated too, because I remember you and I went back and forth on that string arrangement a little bit. Saw you in a bright, clear field, hurricane heat in my head. Oh. That one section, I wish I could write again. So I feel like there's a, there should have been a, a line going with the cello. But otherwise, I, I'm happy with that string section. We talked about making that pause longer before the last chorus for dr- dramatic effect. And here it goes to the double time snare drum. Surprising the big intro. And that end section, that halftime, is kind of a, an interesting thing for us because, you know, 
I mean, we're, I think people generally know us as a pop band or a pop punk band or an emo band or whatever, but we all came out of hardcore, out of the hardcore scene. And um, it's still very much in us on some level. It's something that like when we're not, when we're just messing around, like we, we still play hardcore songs, you know, it's sound check and that kind of thing. And uh, so it was interesting to naturally find ourselves kind of doing a mosh part. I mean, that that is basically a mosh part, but with orchestra, you know, it was kind of just this weird uh, mix of, of worlds that I thought was natural and very Fall Out Boy, but very odd, you know? Yeah, well, it's great. I mean, I, you, you can really tell that you you um, know what you're doing. Now, that world is a world that you could easily just concentrate on. You know, you could forget this pop thing and go back to those <laughs> those metal hardcore roots and, and, and do a whole concert like that easily, you know, it seems. I mean, and the the chops, the skills are still all there, aren't they? And and that's the interesting thing, the way that you can bring those elements in, control them in such a way, and still ultimately make a, a, what you're describing as a, as a pop record. No, but it still is a rock record at the same time. Well, that was the thing, like I said, why Neil was so necessary to the record was I don't think I've ever met anybody else that understands the way those things can combine. You know, the way that you can be I mean, Neil's talked a lot about, you know, when he started out in, you know, engineering in LA and stuff and engineering on, you know, hair metal records and, you know, funk records. And, and I feel like the, the kind of pedigree of working with that diverse, a, a set of, you know, he's doing wallflowers records and, you know, like whatever, he kind of knows a little bit of everything. And that's kind of what we are on some level. And that's what we need. And there's very few producers that I know that are like that, you know, are like us, really. Yeah, fascinating. Um, we will move on. And the next song we're going to look at is Heaven, Iowa. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be back with more Fallout Boy. This episode is being supported by Tape It, the voice note app designed specifically for musicians and songwriters. And I've got one of the masterminds behind Tape It here with me now. Hello, Thomas. Great to have you on. So why did you create Tape It? Hi, John. It's great to be here. Um, We created Tape It because we know so many musicians and songwriters that record their song ideas on the phone all the time. And pretty much everybody uses Apple's voice memos for it. And it's so easy to record something, but you never find anything again. And so I called my old bass player, Jan, and said, Jan, this is silly. Why don't we build the software that we want? And so over the last three years, We fixed a lot of small things. We made it much easier to find recordings. There's automatic instrument detection. You can attach notes, text notes. You can attach photo notes. You can take a photo of your pedal settings, of your synth preset. You can set markers. You can record straight from your lock screen. And then we made it really easy to listen to long recordings and skim through them. So loads of small things. That sounds brilliant. So many of the artists that we talk to use voice notes to record their ideas as they're having them. And yet they often have that very problem where they can't find the voice note. I mean, even within the episode as we're recording it. But to have all those features inbuilt sounds fantastic. Yeah, it's exactly that. And so I think we fixed that and we made it available for free. No ads. You can just go to the App Store and download Tape It and your organizational worries are gone. And then there's a completely optional paid upgrade. And the paid upgrade changes the recording quality. What we do is combine two microphones on your phone, and then we apply much gentler dynamic range compression. And instead of explaining you the sound, let me just play you two examples. The first one is a vocal line and voice memos, and then we'll listen to it and tape it. We'll see the walls come down and we'll breathe in. Will you walk with me? Will you walk with me? We'll see the walls come down and we'll breathe in. Will you walk with me? Will you walk with me? There you go. Same phone. Wow. Well, it seems to me like a no-brainer to be downloading Tape It, but we also have a special offer for our Tape Notes listeners. You can use the extra features for an entire month, no strings attached. Head to tape.it slash tape notes. That's tape.it slash tape notes. Thanks again to Thomas. And now on with the show. The next song we're going to look at from So Much for Stardust by Fallout Boy is Heaven, Iowa. And Neil will play a little blast of the master before we get digging into it. (laughs) 
6 a.m. on Holland Drive. Moonlight Sonata and I. First movement, you and I. And a screw top bottle of wine. Have a spool on the floor. I feel so a star is born. Kiss my cheek, baby, please. Would you read my eulogy? I will never ask you for anything except a dream sweet of me. I will never ask you for anything except a dream sweet of me. Tell me when the party ends, will you still love who I am? I am. It really does go so big there. That is A Little Taste of Heaven, Iowa by Fall Out Boy. And that's a pretty good example, in a way, of of the R&B and rock elements coming together, in a way. You know, that multi-track yeah. vocal before you go for the star-crossed lovers then, and when that comes in, it sounds so so rock, but you put it in a different context, so it has a different feel. And that's something you've done for so, well, since you began, really. So where did this one start? So... Uh, typically I kind of just start with Pete's lyrics and see what that inspires me to, you know, how does this sound? You know, and what is, when I read this, what do I think this sounds like? And when, when he sends, when Pete sends you those lyrics, so is Pete working on lyrics all the time? He's just working on lyrical ideas. And then does he ever put a tune to it or does he, he just no, sends you no, a never. blank he, page? He doesn't even send lyrics in lyric mm. form. He just sends words. And it's interesting when you see it, it's almost like, one liner after one liner, <laughs> and I'll just get an email of those, and then you kind of have like the to... Henny Young Men of lyrics. <laughs> yeah, and then you have to <laughs> kind of. I mean, it's it's like the my my dad had a Yogi Berra quote book sitting on his uh, coffee table. It's kind of like that, where it's like just one liner, one liner, one liner, and you and you have to figure out what thematically goes together, what feels like the same song. But then also, I do try to kind of keep things together as much as possible where, because I feel like he's in a place where it does feel like one thought, you know? And, um, but yeah, when he sends it, that's all he sends. There's no music, anything. And so when I read it, there's kind of a, for me, almost a passive thing where I read it and just imagine what it sounds like to me. And so this one scared me a lot because it felt kind of sparse. And I don't really like sparse. I don't really like singing by myself. I don't really like, you know, I like orchestras. I like, I like being a music, one musician out of, you know, hundreds. I don't really like being so front and center. And I, I could tell that there was something really intimate about this song. And that was a big challenge for us because, well, for me, I don't know. I, everybody else seemed convinced, but I was like, as soon as I finished demoing it and I sent it in to, I sent it out to everybody, everybody went for it. This, I think, is the first song that we started, or one of the first songs yep. that we started, Neil, when you and I got together, it's from the first session. I think it's the, it's, and the, you know, we had done, like I said, that first session of, you know, are we going to work together or whatever? This came from that session. But I think we also spent the longest on figuring out how to actualize it because I wasn't satisfied with just my voice. Like with just my voice over, over keys, I couldn't, it was killing me. It was too naked or something. <laughs> So I needed, and I needed more of a story happening with the, with the synths and that, and the guitars and all of that. So that took us a long time. <laughs> Interesting. And uh, is Heaven, Iowa a place? I believe so. I believe it's, I don't know if it's real or not. I believe it's the place from um, Field of Dreams. Pete was really obsessed with right. Field of Dreams. There's something, something in that story that really like set his vision for the whole record lyrically, I guess. So... I think that's what it is, but I don't ask. I try not to ask about his lyrics because I feel like there's a there's a thing about it where first off he doesn't he gives you ter he will not explain things, but second off it also kind of I, I think there's something to that you know where I'll read something I'll read his lyrics and I'll interpret it one way 
And, you know, years later, I'll realize it's another way. You know, there's, there's so many, there's so many double entendres that I, I've only gotten, you know, decades later. <laughs> I'll be singing them. I'm like, oh, it's a sex thing. I didn't catch that, you know. <laughs> that, that's great. I mean, that's really interesting because, you know, he has this great ability to come out with these great lines, you know, that, that mm-hmm. usually have a double entendre, but also contrast. Yeah. You know, they start one at one place and yeah. then they end in another. There's always a a reverse switch going on mm. in so much of what he does. But it's fascinating to think that, you no, know, you don't question or, or don't ask, but at the same time, you are performing the task of an, an editor because you're mm-hmm. taking them, rearranging them, coming up with musical ideas inspired by them, and then, you know, working to make the most out of, out of the combination. I try to understand them as much as I can. But Yeah, Patrick, I don't know what your thought is, but certainly the three songs that we chose lyrically, they all feel like you know, in a way, a singular person, yet anybody can relate to the idea of issues that you might be having or and how they're affecting your relationship. And they all, and they all, they're all pretty deep. In fact, I had texted Pete before we got started today and just said, you know, just calling up some of these songs and listening to the lyrics again. Uh, And I know, you know, obviously, Patrick, you as the editor, putting it all together, but it's just, there's, there's really some deep stuff in there. Um, you know, when I mixed the Linkin Park record, I Minutes to Midnight, I mixed that record and it was only kind of more later that I really thought about, you know, how painful some of those lyrics were. And so I think kind of, you know, looking back on it and not being in the minutia of the record in a way and just kind of seeing it more big picture, it just, it really, um, it struck me. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I feel like a lot of times I'll be, I'm looking for a story. I'm looking for the story of a song and, and where it goes. And so lyrically, I'm playing with that and I'm just attaching to attaching to the craft of like the story part. And then it'll be like, yeah, years later, I'm like, wow, that's a heavy lyric. Yeah. I never really, you know, like that Pete must have felt that thing. Yeah. And I don't, I don't really question it when I'm writing. You know, it's, it's kind of unfair to him probably because I'm like, you know, should I check on him? You know, but like he'll he'll put these things into lyrics. But I just I get so focused on the on the like, oh, that's a really good lyric to set up his next line here. Yeah. You know, it whatever. I, I'm I'm more thinking in the in the craft of a song, you know, story of a song kind of thing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, let's hear how you put Heaven Iowa together then. Uh okay, so Patrick, if you don't mind, I'll just run through a few things here. Yeah, please. So I think the thing that starts the song is this loop. And I think Patrick had, this is the demo loop that originally came to us. And I think that demo loop was some, was some loop, you know, with some like splice loop or something that I had, right. that I, I was just looking for. I was literally at this stage of demoing. Like, so... You know, it's it's interesting. Sometimes I I demo things out fully. This song I had a little bit less of a sense of because, as I said, I was a little bit scared of it. So I wasn't really thinking that strictly about what it was going to sound like. So I just put in some loop. You know, I didn't really think twice about it. And we found as we were going through recording that that specific rhythm worked really well. But then I didn't want to just use some stock loop from a sample pack or something. So Neil and I kind of meticulously made our own, you know. Yeah, so I'll just quickly go through it. This is this is the original recreation of the loop here. Some of this are, are other sounds or loops and other things are us playing live instruments or Patrick playing a shaker or something. So there was this this loop. And then on top of that and all these elements there's a shaker. And then like an atmosphere and all these just different. If I remember right, that was something that I had found like a, an atmosphere, an atmospheric sound, like a white noise sound kind of thing. And I played it on a synth, you know. Yeah. So all together, they kind of made this kind of interesting atmospheric version of that kind of concept of the loop. And then we also did kind of a maraca loop to go with it, to add a little bit more Mm -hmm. percussion um, attack to it. 
And as you can see, if you're looking at the screen, you can see it's all cut up because we wanted to have all these different pannings going on. So we put each little maraca hit in there so they would pan to different places. They're kind of unnaturally tight too. Yep. And then mixing that with the loop that we created. That's kind of the whole basis of the intro. So it was it was actually quite a bit of work to to make what sounds like <laughs> a little loop. Uh, but it's kind of funny in, in looking back of the history of that loop. So that, that kind of started it. And then um, this is, I think actually a lot of these, maybe this is an original loop or a pad. Is this, mm. this is original from the demo? Yeah, so basically we just kept layering. We just kept adding things. So I did my, my synths on the demo but then over the course of it we would just i was just never satisfied with the the journey of the sound i wanted things to kind of appear in and out and kind of swell in and and um i, I we just couldn't get enough things in there and i would t every day i would tell joe i was like go nuts you know send what you have and so joe would do like a <laughs> kind of thing or I would go through the synths. Uh, Neil has some synthesizers at his house. I have a lot of synthesizers at my house. And I would kind of just find noises. I would spend like every day on the recording, at least once a day, I would just fiddle with something and see if I got a layer that we could add to this song. Because I felt like I just wasn't getting enough noise, enough motion, you know. I wanted it to feel like, um, I always liked, um, I mean, everybody likes Peter Gabriel so uh, but one of the things that I love about that record is when you listen to it, there's all these little moments that just pop in and out. And it's, it's a little bit more, I don't know, it's, it's a fascinating, it's a challenge to mix, but it's a fascinating journey as a producer. And I wanted to, I wanted to do something like that. But then again, of course, I, you know, I put a lot on Neil to have to sift through that. Yeah. So the you know the original demo patrick you probably remember this the first chorus is actually a big drum it's yeah. like it's a big full band chorus and patrick said to me and i think we even demoed the original us putting together mm -hmm. the full arrangement was like that and then you yes. at some point you would call me and said hey you know what i really see this song kind of building more and maybe we don't have drums in the first chorus or something yeah well, the thing was that it, it forced us into a weird place with the second verse, because then once you go, once you go to drums, once you go to like big rock drums, then it comes down again for the second verse. And it felt like a sudden loss of motion. It felt like the whole song just kind of lost it. And so we were trying to figure it out. Yeah. And then it became an idea of, so what, what now is the second chorus with the full band, you know, and drums and heavy guitar, that was both choruses originally, or the first two choruses originally. And uh, yeah, we thought that maybe it just wasn't adding the motion that we wanted. And so so then Neil made up a, he basically took out everything that was there except my vocal pass. And um, I had recorded piano, I think. So it was just piano pad. Uh, and then I think Neil added a synth bass or something. And that was what we worked with for a while. But I, I still wasn't convinced of that section. That first chorus was vital to me of getting that right. And it took us a long time to get that right. Yeah, we, I, I put in, you know, that programmed kick and, and some reverse stuff and just to kind of get a vibe for that co first chorus. And it was very late. I think we were actually in Seattle when we did a lot of that poly evolver. Yeah, well, uh, that was synth. what saved it. Yeah. Eventually, it was the poly evolver. One of the things, just backing up real quickly here in the in the verse that I thought was cool was um, the way Joe was playing this very ambient guitar pedal, and I thought mm -hmm. it really worked so nicely with the vocal and how it yes. interplayed in between all the lyrics. And so I just wanted to play a little bit of that. I thought it was cool. And these are the kind of things that I thought saved a lot of it. We solo Joe.
So it's really this beautiful soundscapey sound, but just where he placed them, I thought was really cool. I will never ask you for anything except a dream sweet of me. I will never ask you for anything except a dream sweet of me. Tell me when. Yeah, and I just thought those placements were super cool. And yes. He was just really paying attention to the, the vocal, and I thought that was. So that's something you see when bands have kind of grown up. They're, you know, it's not just about I'm the guitar player. I'm playing attention to mm-hmm. my guitar. I'm paying attention to other things around me in the arrangement and to make the whole the whole thing better. Yeah, and and I think um, I, I also love what he does with pedals and sounds and things. He he spends a really long amount of time figuring out, you know it makes for a really interesting thing in a scenario like this, where I say like, I need something, I need something atmospheric. I'm not, I'm hitting a wall. I'm not finding the thing to add. And then he comes with something like that. And it's, you know, it's perfect. It's great. It really, it really stepped it up. Yep. And then going to the first chorus, um, let's see if I can kind of just play musically what's Mm -hmm. happening. So there's some of Joe strumming on the downbeats and then there's the piano but the the synth elements were really important to me in landing this because I feel like it it just wasn't right we tried it with um, guitars we tried it with you know any number of synths and so, you know, there's a lot of, there were a lot of plug-in synths and, and things that I was using, but we had, we had gone up to Seattle and I had, I had brought out my uh, Poly Evolver and my Fismo. <laughs> and um, just because they're two very odd sounding synths or specific sounding synths. And we just basically went through presets one at a time, you know, seeing if anything rang on this section of the song. And we, we did like... I don't know, 20 or 30 things before we landed on what we landed on. But yeah, um, these are some of the ones we we mm -hmm. chose. I forgot about this one. Yeah, is that the Fismo? I think so. It it says poly evolver, but I'm not sure I agree with that. Yeah, I know. It sounds more Fismo to me. It's cool. It gives it. And then on top of that, Joe's guitar. Yeah. And we had the kick drum. Now that was a kick sample you had, Neil? Yep. It's interesting this combination of sounds because it creates a certain kind of atmosphere that's really quite hard to place because it it conjures up church, maybe. Mm -hmm. It could be a church organ, but it also conjures up horror movie soundtracks, I think. And it's interesting because it adds this feeling of jeopardy possibly yeah. that these star-crossed lovers you know that it could all collapse that you know that this destiny that has brought them together is going to pull them apart and it has that almost um yeah edgy sinister element to it that adds to the tension of of the story of the song somehow i Old think challenge um it took us like i said so long to find that that right level it's almost like um when i listen to thriller there's like a, a loop, like a two bar loop right before Vincent Price starts. Right, that. And the specific layers of synth in that are like, I could write a thesis on on how special that is. You know, it's like, it just, it just is perfect. It's the perfect layering of sounds. And so you kind of, it, this one needed the right layer of elements that, that achieved that same kind of thing where if you took out any one layer of it, it just wouldn't do, you know, it wouldn't do the thing, you know, the feeling. 
Yeah, I'd say normally when I'm producing, I try to have as few elements in as possible, if they're, especially if they're not adding really to the party. If you have, you know what I mean? And all those elements are adding to the party in a way that, it, like Patrick said, if you take one out, it really feels very different. And so I love that about that, despite the fact that there are a lot of elements going on there. Um, so just, I, I guess I'm kind of, interested in moving if it's okay with you to move through just like yeah. the different sections because this song is mm-hmm. a is a real journey so in the second verse there are some kind of i had this little box called a rhythm arranger at my house and it's basically like the percussion section of an old uh like wurlitzer organ kind of thing that people would have in their house and uh we use that we took a sample of each sound and, and arranged it into a pattern. So that was kind of a basis for the rhythm section for the second verse, along with the bass thing. And of course the loop is still going through here. And then we had some guitar. It's got some kind of pedal on it, maybe a phaser or was that your uh, strat again? It doesn't say, but it might be. And then there's, you know, a couple other effects. Those are Joe. So that's the big stop. And then there's also the same pad, I believe, going through there. And then there's a little... Yeah, Joe does this dual harmony thing there. And then that, I think, is synth. Or is that is that Joe or is that synth? No, I think that's Joe's synth okay. that he added at the end. I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. And then halfway through the verse, we added these drums. And when we did this, we set up Andy and I with... Is it concert toms or is it, were they like roto toms almost? You one one guy had roto toms and That's the right. other guy had like concert toms. Yeah, so we and we played that together, which I, I like. I really love the the way it sang in the room. You know that we were playing. It wasn't like an overdub. It was that we played it all at the same time. So that's the two of you. Mm-hmm. That's you. Yeah, Patrick and Andy yeah. together, double drummer. One, one of the mm-hmm. cool things is we used a, a harmonizer to tune the drums down. So that Mm -hmm. they would sound even more just kind of affected and cool. You can hear one of the guys playing more constant eighth notes and the other guy. And so that that was um that was fun. At, you know, adding that into the second half. So that, that whole verse is a real journey of all those different elements. And then you can kind of, I'll play everything together with the vocal. And I will never ask you for anything except a dream sweet of me. I will never ask you for anything except to dream sweet of me. Tell me when the And um, I think at least for a, a substantial part of the recording, whether or not it ended up all the way to the the end, I don't I don't remember. But I'm pretty sure this is one where we used my the the backing vocals that I had tracked because we were basically using the same setup. I, I have a 47 uh, that I run through a through like an 1176 and um like a some kind of Neve Neve pre and uh, I think an LA 2A and that was pretty much what we did for the whole chain for everything. So I would, some of the background vocals um, I was doing at home and, you know, ended up making them all the way to the record. Right. And, and did you use that for your lead vocal as well? Yes. I pretty much, that's, yeah. that's like my standard. And, you know, depending on the, on the performance, I'll change um, attack times and things like that. But otherwise it's pretty much that. Very interesting. Um, is there anything else that we should hear from Heaven, Iowa? I guess you could play the last chorus just showing what's there. I mean, this is the original idea of what the of what the chorus was, was like a big, you know, 
heavy guitar thing. Okay, I, I'd also love to check out show the bridge a little bit because I think okay, Joe's yeah, sure. part in there is really cool. Yeah, Joe. So that was a so Joe, like I said, he was sick and he couldn't really come into the studio all that all that often and whatever. And so he was a little bit of the at home player, you know. And on this song in in particular, I told him to just go nuts because I had I had an idea, but I needed more layers than I could possibly think of, you know. Um, I just wanted so many layers of things for this little journey. And the bridge, I think, was a really great confluence of the synth thing and the guitar thing that I was doing. And then what Joe brought in, you know, it really came together. I think I might have been one layer of the harmonies, if I remember right. Yeah, there's, I think I, there's, there's this, there's those layers, and there's another harmony. So there's that, and... Yeah. Is that you or Joe? I don't remember. That, I think, if I remember right, that was Joe. That was one of Joe's... I had had something playing the, playing an identical part, but I liked his sound better. And then another another thing that's interesting, just backing up just slightly, the fill going into the second chorus mm -hmm. was this was from Patrick's demo, I believe. So it was kind of this synthy drums, and the one going into the chorus. The set third chorus was a combination of that with the roto toms and concert toms that Patrick and Andy were playing. So there, you know, those those harmonized drums, which I thought was cool to kind of bring everybody together before the last chorus. Now, Neil, when yeah. you harmonized it, did you harmonize the entire chain, or or is like the room because it almost sounded like. Um, like one of the, like maybe a room mic or something was in the original tuning or something. I'm pretty sure it's all, the whole kit is just harmonized. Okay. I think we mixed it down to a stereo track and then okay. and harmonized it. Um, all right. So yeah, let's talk through, I guess let's go through the last chorus. And there's not much to it. It's just kind of, again, kind of a, a, you know, an example of what else we do on this record, but also just in general, you know, to Neil's point, usually Neil likes to work with, very few elements and just blow them up. And so that was kind of the, the choruses were like that, the latter choruses. And then Pete had said to Joe to go to go full slap. <laughs> that was Pete's idea. Uh, yep. Was just have like a slash moment at the very end. And then just to finish up the the song, just went back to the intro, that first line of the song to kind of bookend it yeah sounding amazing um we will have another break and the next song we're going to look at is the title track so much for stardust hello sorry to interrupt your listening i hope you've been enjoying the episode as i mentioned earlier i wanted to let you know more about our patreon and how it works as well as one-off donations to help support the show, we have three separate tiers which you can subscribe to. Perks include access to full-length video episodes, magazine-style gear lists, and the opportunity to ask questions for upcoming guests. So if those perks sound good to you and you'd like to help support the show, we would love to see you over on the Take Notes Patreon. Thank you. And now, on with the show. The next song we're going to look at from the new album by Fall Out Boy is the title track, So Much for Stardust. And I think Neil's going to give us a blast of the master now before we get digging in. I'm in 
a little taste of so much for stardust and it still does amaze me every time i hear in isolation the, you know the, these songs you know and we're intently listening to them just how much you do in sh- such a short space of time i mean that that track moved through so many different genres within the space of a minute or so because you know you went from the start with the with the piano and it could be like a a jazz trio maybe with a little string section on the side and then you've got these horn stabs where it could be like a big soul band and you know so much is going on and it's fascinating because each member of the band could be you know following these as particular avenues for a a, a lifetime (laughs) career (laughs) no and at the same time you're all bring them all together and you're fallout boy yeah we we couldn't do it without each other like i said so yeah, but this one was weird. This one, I uh, I barely sent the demo. I I was sure no one was going to like this one. I, I didn't. I had made it, and I liked it, but it was just kind of fairly far afield of our kind of repertoire, I guess. And so I was like, you know, probably don't need to send this one. But I did, and it kept surviving. I actually remember Neil and I were talking about this, too, because Neil and I have this interesting rapport where you know, generally, we like the same stuff. We like the same, you know, music that we're working on. But there's also every so often this like, you know, intellectual part of you that goes, well, but we can't do this because no one's going to like this, whatever. And so I think both of us had kind of struck this song off the record. And it was really Pete um, that was like, no, that that's a priority. And um, I was kind of surprised. I didn't really, I didn't think he was going to go for it. But um yeah, it works. As I recall, Patrick, I, the very original demo, which I can't find anywhere, yeah, sure. I don't think had a chorus. I think it was just a verse. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it was and, just a verse. And it, but I always found the the thing kind of hypnotic in this very cool hip hop way, the verse that I loved with the the beat and the rhythm of the and soul in the soul soulful mm-hmm. vocal and everything. I just thought that was super cool. But it just was never really a completed song. Yeah. And then at some point, you finished, put a chorus to it. Yeah, and I don't think we kind of imagined it being a fit. Like I said, I was kind of like, this was one of the, you know, I would demo a bunch of songs and, you know, maybe in a day I'd, I'd kind of play around with like four or five ideas or something. And at the end of the day, you know, I'll send out an email, you know, with all the, with all the songs. And this was kind of just in, you know, it was an afterthought to put it in there. And um, ended up naming the record after it, you know. So it was, uh, it was great. It just I yeah. really didn't, I didn't see it coming. Yeah. So what are we going to listen to first? So I guess you know, just to talk briefly through this, the the string intro, uh, which is very different from "Love from the Other Side." Yeah. This is this is an octet, so it's a much smaller. And you know, in the mix, I wanted this to feel like a chamber string group as opposed to a a big orchestra and so i want to be more intimate i mean you can imagine kind of being in somebody's chambers listening to Mm -hmm. this you know in the Mm -hmm. 1700s or something (laughs) Uh, and it's really beautiful if i remember right we had the octet track on everything on all the songs and then Pretty quickly, there were a handful of them where like, this just isn't going to work. This just isn't going to be enough because it felt 
like a chamber, you know, and something like other side feels so massive, you know. And so we scrapped most of those strings, um, unfortunately, uh, on those songs. But then this one, it really was this intimate thing, really. And and we recorded it at Igloo. Igloo has a really great sound for kind of chambery stuff. And um, where is Igloo? Igloo's in uh, Burbank, a great studio in Burbank that we did. Um, we did strings there. I'm trying to remember if we did anything else there. I think we only did strings there on this. And then, um, all right, so then the piano comes in with the rhythm section, and this is Patrick playing piano. And, and then one of the cool things I, 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 you know, just from a production engineering side of things for this song is the drums that Andy played on uh, as we were recording it, you know, the concept was in my mind to have two very different sounding vibes for the verse mm -hmm. and chorus. It just needed to, I mean, kind of like what you said, Patrick really writes these journeys and each section can be very different, but the trick is making them feel like they belong. You know, arms race was a song like that as well, where it was a real challenge to make, the chorus feel like it blended yeah. to that hip hop verse. It was related to the same song. Yeah, exactly. But I think, again, that's what makes Fall Out Boy uniquely Fall Out Boy, which is cool. Anyway, so when we were recording the drums, the first, the verse drums, we were getting the sounds for. And as we were doing it, my engineer, Eric, uh, we were talking through the sounds and it was getting close as we were working through all the mics. But I just kept feeling like, the snare was not doing the thing that I wanted it to do. So I just reached over and turned the preamp all the way up or nearly all the way up on the snare mic. So it started to distort in this really cool overtone way. And that's what I was like, oh, okay, now it's alive. Now I'm feeling like that separation of the kick and the snare. And so you'll hear that when I solo the drums. So it's, you know, it's still, it's a live kit, but it's got a totally different spark than a rock kit. And there's no room mics in there or very little. It's really close mics just kind of doing that thing. And I had on the demo, when I played it, I think I just put up one mic or something. I was being very lazy. And my drums, I had this like Slingerland kit and it was kind of dead. And... Um, it was interesting trying, it took us a while to like find, because it, it sounded bad. I mean, it was a demo, but it, it kind of put us into this place where what is the matured version of that? What does that sound like, you know? And it, it really took us out of rock kit stuff, you know? Maybe we could play, we could compare those if we, if we wanted to hear that too. Right, so and it was dead, but there was stuff the, the way that I had kind of lazily mic'd it, kind of, we found ourselves wanting to do that, you know, or doing something like that or evoke that feel. And then, you know, so we ended up in a different kind of lane with the more distorted. Let me go back just a little bit here. But yeah, so I think because it was a smaller attack thing, it kind of allowed for more of those ghost notes, more of the kind of intricacies of those those hi hat ands, even the volume of the kicks. Um, I think it was that kind of trying to find, trying to find a, a tone that really matched that. And um, yeah, I love what Neil did with the the distorted snare. I think it like nails it perfectly. Yeah, as we transition into the chorus, it turns into rock drums, and we'll. So we're still here in this distorted land, first distorted, but the pattern's changing. So those are different drum passes, different drum recordings? Yes. On different kits? Completely different kit, yep. I think, yeah. too. And different players, or is it Andy no, it's all, each time? No, it's all Andy. It's all Andy. It's all Andy. Yeah, all we, Andy. we changed out various... Yeah, we've tr changed out various drums in the in the set. All of a sudden, the room mics are coming in, and uh, the snare is getting deeper. And again, that's kind of the trick is 
you can hear it soloed, but in the song, you you also feel, hear it, but it doesn't sound foreign. They feel like they blend and 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 work together. Yeah, but they really help make that transition as the whole sound and shape of the song changes. Then it evolves it in a way that doesn't draw attention to itself. Now, one thing I would love to play is Neil. Can you play the chorus of the demo? Because I think the biggest change that we made from the demo was kind of simpling out the simplifying the drums a lot because I had just kind of I was just kind of going nuts you know and I didn't really have an idea for a groove for the chorus and I think that was probably one of the most significant changes was finding a proper kick snare pattern yeah. you know <laughs> This is the demo. Mm -hmm. Yes, the demo. And this is me playing drums and sloppily filling the whole time. Hmm. And I, it was kind of like a balance of finding that urgency that I was playing with, but then having something that's more, because Andy is a, it's funny because I'm a drummer too, but Andy and I are very different drummers and, and it's always cool translating our things between each other because he's, he comes from metal, like proper, right? And so, and metal is very strict, you know, it's, it is to, you, you play like you're a metronome, you play to a grid, you know? And I'm more of like a, I guess, funk drummer or something. And um, because of that, it was very important that we had a, a more established, you know, this is the part, you know, you can fill on this end of it but like this is the part because and that's how andy's comfortable playing he likes to have parts you know right so i think another thing to note is the guitar arrangement kind of throughout and how that evolves through the song uh the stuff that patrick and joe did together so playing it from like part of the verse it sounds like me yeah i think so And that's Joe, arpeggios. And then that, that effect is definitely Joe, and I'm the rhythms. Yep. So there's a lot of interesting layers. And also this high layer. And I think that was me on your strat. There's a strat and a telly yeah, on that. Right. And that was the thing. So the rhythm, I mean, if anyone cares, a lot of the jangly stuff was uh, tellies and strats. And then the rhythm stuff was mostly my those guilds. I would do either a guild like S100 or I, I think I did have a, an old... Les Paul that we would double with sometimes. But it was just, I think the, if I remember right, the Guild was a little, like, held tuned better than that particular Les Paul, so that was what we used. Yep. And then in the verses, we got some horn stabs. And that's the Jerry Hay sessions. Right. And the thing about that was I, on the demo, I, like, played trumpet and trombone and that, and poorly. And, uh, I knew we were going to replace it. I didn't know we were going to replace it with them. <laughs> and so it was. It really took the song to another level, too, because Jerry really went for it in the arrangement, too. He arranged... Um, did the chorus arrangement, brass arrangement, make it to the record? Because he... We didn't, we didn't ask him to do that. Yeah, he just went with it. He built it up so when we get to the last chorus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just the that was a that was one of the things with Jerry that was so amazing is he had these notes, very fast notes, where he'd be like, okay, um, we're gonna do a pass. 
I want you to put this on the right channel. And then we're going to do another pass. And he put different sheet music in front of the players. And he's like, we're going to put this on the, on the left channel. And he had this just incredible blend. So, so the, what the trumpet's doing on the right side versus I think it's one of the saxophones on the left side, it's magic to me. He's one of those guys who understands horn arrangement, but also horn recording in a specific way that, you know, it was really like this, it was the kind of stuff that I was so grateful to be there for because I, I don't necessarily um, hate, you know, making things in box. I think there's plenty of awesome, brilliant records that are made in box these days too. But it was really neat to like hear that because I'm like, then I'm going back and listening to Toto records and being like, oh, that's why. You know what I mean? Like he just had this, uh, it made the job very easy for us. And then also it made the, you know, as we were kind of figuring out the guitars and what the guitars were going to do, because this song was a very strange place for guitars originally. It didn't really have much guitar when I wrote it originally. It was great because then the horn section filled in a, a substantial chunk of the midsection. So we didn't need have, like necessarily the wall of, of heavy distorted guitars that was kind of fighting with the piano anyway. Yeah. And then um, I guess the other thing to note is, I mean, there's plenty of other stuff we could talk about, but the song is this really cool kind of circular chord progression that one of those things that just kind of keeps coming around and it can literally just keep coming up over and over. And I think, you know, that partially drove us to the idea of a fade mm -hmm. out, but, um, you know, the end has the Waters family as yeah. doing choir stuff with Patrick ad-libbing along with them. And I think it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, I remember them being a little tripped up by your rhythms, <laughs> Patrick, yeah. as we were doing that. I mean, it was incredible. The, um, I sat at the piano and play, and we and there was this moment where we got out of work, and the five of us were just having a lot of fun, me and the Waters, and um, Oren kept having this idea of kind of heightening the syncopation in it, and we played that like loop for probably like twenty minutes or something. <laughs> Um, yes. And it was one of these things where once he started doing that, everybody in the room, you know, our faces all lit up. And there was this really musical moment where, you know, as a collective, we were like, oh, yeah, we got something, you know, that was when it really landed for me. And I remember being like, you know, it was such a pinch me thing, you know. I think there's some synth stuff at the end to talk, you know, I don't know if much oh, yeah. to talk about, but... The synths, after we had done Heaven, Iowa, I, I, I was so happy with the uh, poly evolver that I was like, okay, let's see what you got. And uh, that was what I pulled together, I think. It's mostly poly evolver. And then I think that, I think that's an inbox, like um, plug-in synth, soft synth. But yeah, I think I made that that night before we went in to record it. The other thing to note, I think cool lyrically is that Patrick, I don't know if it was your idea or Pete's idea to incorporate some of the lyric from Love from the Other Side that was, into this song. That was mine, and he was, he was kind of hesitant about it. He was like, we'll change that, obviously. And I was like, no, I think we should do it. Because I had kind of, by that point, because these were, uh, Stardust and uh, Love from the Other Side were, were really completed towards the end of the recording. And by that point, I was like, other side's got to open, Stardust has to close. I just felt like they were, as story beats, they were so great. There's something about the pessimism and resignation of, of his lyrics in Stardust that I was like, I don't know. I loved doing it that way. I loved ending. It's like, an, it's like Empire Strikes Back. It's like ending on, on a down note, you know, kind of. So because of that, I wanted it to bookend. And so I wanted the lyrics to be it's also a kind of similar thing where it goes to that um, piano and string and vocal moment. And uh, I, is this the one where my original string arrangement was all off? Where I, I had sent in the string arrangement and then, Neil, you went, 
because I it, it all it was all working with itself, and I had just totally because I wrote it like late one night, and I totally didn't think about the vocal melody, and so the strings worked with each other and with the piano and stuff, but it didn't like my vocal melody made a minor second somewhere, and so like last yeah minute, yeah I, we spent a yeah. lot of time just kind of trying to figure that out so, yeah last minute yeah. like while they're while this is so embarrassing as a composer this the string players are in the room and I'm like oh okay you know like whatever so. We could play the string arrangement for the bridge there if we wanted to. Yeah, sure. But you got it right. Eventually. You were the sunshine of my lifetime. What would you trade the pain for? I'm not sure. In another life, you were my babe. In another life, you were the sunshine. And there's still a couple, like, kind of fuzzy harmonic moments in there, but I really, that, that ascending melody in the violins was real important to me for some reason, just with the lyric. So I had to figure out how to make that work, you know? Yeah, it's awesome. Should we round up with another blast of the master or do you want to play that crescendo that you were talking about? And that would be a yeah, good sure. way to finish off this song. Life, you were my babe in another life. You were the sunshine of my lifetime. What would you trade the pain for? I'm not sure. In another life, you were my babe in another life. You were the sunshine of my lifetime. What would you trade the pain for? I'm not sure. I used yeah, and Andy is playing here. Just live in the room. Felt so big. are in the Waters family? Uh, there's the four. Right. And um, they kind of naturally uh, and kind of quickly divvy up parts. Um, I mean, they're, they're, you know, legends in, in the studio world in Los Angeles for sure. So it was really cool. It was really cool getting to do it with them. And then as a singer, you know, because I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not the most confident singer all the time. And, um, they were so encouraging and I got so much energy from them. So when I'm doing the, the riffing at the end, the waters are on the other side of the, of the mirror or the uh, other side of the window uh, in the control room. And they're like, you know, they were cheering me on. And that really, I, I, you can almost hear it in the performance, I feel like, is that like I was getting a lot of like, I was getting inspired by them being like, yeah, you got it, you know. And uh and recording in the pandemic, I mean, did you have to stop and start a lot of times? Were you able to yes. continue in the way that we're doing now by, you know, communicating online? So we did do some online stuff. Uh, we used like, you know, audio movers and listen to and that sort of thing. Um, but then by the end of it, it was kind of essentially back to normal session wise. And um, yeah, it was interesting because this is definitely the most globe trotting record we've made in that regard. You know, the um, the strings... Like I said, the, the orchestra stuff was done at Angel in London. I didn't go there. I just, you know, audio movers, <laughs> whatever. But um, right. But because of that, I think it, it kind of, when it came together, it's, um, it's pretty amazing. It, it feels more, I don't know, it was more of a journey. It's more of a surprise, too, as a writer, because I feel like when you do everything, you know, it sounds a certain way in your head. I mean, the demos, you hear what it sounds like to me. But then when you get to the final, the finished product, you wouldn't get those things if it were still in your head, you know? You wouldn't get what the Waters did. You wouldn't get what Jerry Hay did with the, the horns, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's just neat, neat to do. Yeah. 
Um, we have questions. I'm going to let you go in a minute, but we yeah. have questions that we ask everybody when they come on Take Notes. And the first of them is about gear or tech, um, anything that may be relating to this project that you, you feel was vital to the whole process or, or any piece of equipment or a plug-in or something that you're particularly excited about at the moment. I mean, the Poly Evolver came up quite a lot yes, in that conversation. Yeah, yeah the Poly Evolver um, was a synthesizer made, uh, I want to say early 2000s, but it has a very weird kind of, it, it has a very weird kind of set of, um, cause I want to say it's like obligate stereo out and the, and a lot of the patches are like, you can't really control what's happening in stereo. And it does a lot of really strange things. It's a, it has, it's hard. It's a hard to describe sound. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the guy's name. The sequential circuits guy. Oh, I'm a bad synth nerd. Oh my god, I can't remember his just, name either. Anyway, um, it was something he had designed when when he got the company back. So it has a lot of his like weirdest ideas. And uh, if I remember right, it didn't do very well, and so it kind of has a very very strange hidden gem kind of quality to it. Was it and, Dave um, Smith? A lot of those. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And. Um, but it sounds great. It's just there's so much movement and life in so many of the in so many of the patches to start with and so many of the presets. But then, you know, we spent a lot of, you know, we were tweaking knobs and things. So that was kind of part of the fun of working on it. Also, the Insonic Fismo was my partner in crime with the Poly Evolver. The Fismo has a very I don't even know, at times unpleasant kind of modulation that it does. It's a very odd kind of synth. I'm not even sure how it produces its sounds. I'm not sure what what kind of synthesis it is. It's one of the weirdest sounding synths I've ever heard. It really never works in your song unless it does and then it makes the song. It's one of those ones where I try I try out on everything now that I have it because every once in a while you find something and it and you're like, "Wow, that made this thing sing." But if it doesn't make it sing, it's like it ruins everything. And then, yeah, um, I was using a lot of, um, I was using that Guild uh, the S100, the 70s S100 that um, just really sounded great. Um, we used that all over the record. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Neil, if there's anything you were using that you're loving. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of what I use is, is I have a, a Neve console that we use for recording and some vintage mics between Patrick and stuff that I had. But uh, also, you know, for guitar gear, we were not shy to use pedals where, especially Joe, he really digs in on that stuff. And I have some amps at my place that for, that I like to use. So we mic up everything and we can quickly kind of go between whatever sounds and make combinations of amps. And um, in addition, we might even, you know, bring up something like a guitar rig or something and use that as an effect to blend into an original you know, a guitar sound. So it might be me saying, hey, Joe, what if we make this more ambient or may maybe let's have something modulating or Joe would just, you know, if he's doing it, he'll, he'll just come up with, you know, I'm hearing this and he just, we find a way to kind of get the sound he's hearing in his head yeah. and we'll spend, like Patrick said, we really, we would spend an hour or, or more on a guitar tone kind of just dialing it in perfectly. So yeah. I don't think it's any one thing. It's And, and with the drums, it was... It was always talking through with my engineer. This is what I'm hearing. This is what we're hearing. And Patrick and I might talk before I even talk with my engineer. You know, this is what kind. Of, you know, more rock sound, more hip hop sound, more, you know, high tuned snare drum, more 22 inch kick, more 24 inch kick, or what? You know, we would really go through those kind of elements, and then we'd start yeah. to work on the drum sounds individually for songs. We would change out snare drums and toms and whatever for each song, to fashion the drum kit for each song individually yeah in a lot of ways you're almost like mixing a little bit as you're picking out those things it's like part of the process of it because you know how, what's going to fit where you know such attention to detail it's so impressive and you can really hear it in the record um do you have a routine either of you that you stick to that helps you create or helps you work uh, I don't know. For me, I think I, I think my routine is trying to do some exercise in the morning and clear my head and then coming in and just being as attentive to 
Patrick, Pete, the band, you know, where, where we're at. Sometimes I'll have a little bit of a plan like, hey, let's do some guitars this morning and then sing in the afternoon when your voice is kind of warmed up and those kinds of things. You know, some of the kind of nuts and bolts of production, which is just kind of arranging the day, but also just trying to feel where Patrick's at. You know, sometimes he comes in and is like, I, I want to try a synth on something. And so we just kind of start going down that road and we're plugging in every synth and it can be a little bit of a free for all. And, and sometimes we're like, what should we do? And then it's like, well, let's try and muddle through something like this. Maybe something's stumping us and we'll, no pun intended. <laughs> and we'll, you know, we'll go and we'll, we'll fight through something maybe that day, or maybe we won't even get something that day very much, or maybe Patrick's voice is tired, so we can't sing or whatever. So we, we go on to something yeah. else. Yeah, that was, uh, well, whatever. That's not, that wasn't the question, but yeah, when my voice craps out and then it like changes my whole perspective. Um, yeah, we, uh, I don't really have much of a routine other than I'm going to go and I'm going to work, you know? So, um, I like to when, you know, we, we would start at like 11 or something and basically, you know, there's some, you know, Hey, how you doing? You just, you know, watch this thing last night, whatever. But then we kind of just go in. Um, I don't really like to putz around in the studio all that much. I, I really like to be recording something or dialing something, you know, we really, really, my routine was just, you know, make it to the studio as on time as I can be. I have ADHD. It's very difficult, but I, you know, I'd be there within 10, 15 minutes of whenever I was supposed to be there. And then we just work through it. That's kind of, that's my routine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you have any advice that you could pass on to people listening? Um, so this could be advice that you've picked up along the way. Um, through your personal experience or advice that you've had passed on to you, um, words of wisdom that you've carried with you ever since you, you heard them. I mean, you've got a lot of experience between the two of you. you know, uh, you've yeah. both been doing this music thing for a long time, and, and there's got to be some kind of secret to how you've been able to juggle that and make that work. Well, one piece of advice that I got one time was from you know, total name drop, but Elton John, we did a, a song with Elton John and he said, he just kind of apropos of nothing. He said, you know, he's like, when you find your producer, stick with them. I was like, yeah. He's like, when you find the producer that understands you, stick with them. It's like all my friends that didn't do that, it ruined their careers. I was like, okay. Uh, and Thank then, you, Elton. Uh, yeah, I know. I was, that, was, that was on a record we didn't do with Neil. And I remember thinking like, oh yeah, he, um, but uh, the other one was, um, just my advice, I guess, is that, you know, obviously when you're under a time crunch, prioritize, you know, um, there's a great mixing book that I read one time that had a, it had some really funny chapters. One was about like, you know, you're going to have to deal with people, even though you're a, you're a, you know, mix engineer and you're in a studio all day and that's what you're good at. You're occasionally going to have to talk to human beings. One of the tips that really was so important to me was really prioritizing in the short term what's important. So when Neil and I get together, we have time and we can play around or whatever. And that's part of the, the game. That's part of like what the plan is. But when you're working and it's like time, to, like when Neil's mixing, for example, I'm sure there's a certain level of like, what's the more important thing is like, first and foremost, those vocals have to sound right. Those drums have to be right. When you get those two things where they need to be, you're already so much closer to, to the finish line than you, than you were when you started, right? Not to say that everything else doesn't matter, but it's like, those are the things that are jumping out to the audience first. So when you find yourself spending hours trying to get that one, you know, triangle part to sound perfect, you know, and I, we all do this where you're like, no, it just doesn't sound, it's like, you take a step back and go like, this isn't the thing. This isn't the thing that everyone's going to notice. So Neil and I will make that triangle part sound perfect. But otherwise, like, you don't have to do that. Like when I demo, I don't do that. And you can kind of hear the demos are kind of crunchy and stuff, but they're not like terrible, you know, like there's a thing there. And it's like, you can get your idea out without killing yourself, I guess is the thing. Yeah. Neil, I mean, it you, you've worked with so many different people and you've taken on so many different roles within recording. Yeah, honestly, I struggle with this all the time. 
because people do ask me. And, you know, for me, I guess my path was started out as an electrical engineer, always played instruments growing up. Uh, my main instrument was trumpet. And when I went to college, I kind of gave up music and went into electrical engineering because that seemed like the more stable <laughs> concept to do. And after a year of being in college, I was like, I miss music too much. And my favorite class was my elective in a music class. So I switched majors to music, uh, much to the chagrin of my parents. And I think the thing for me was that I just had to follow my passion. And it was more important to me that I did what I loved than, you know, maybe a more steady monetary gig. So my advice is do the thing that's really passionate for you. And if music is the thing that's passionate for you, do it and do it all the time. You know, it's that 10,000 hour kind of mantra of that outliers book where it's like, you just have to spend all your time. There's no, there is no shortcut. I mean, yeah, you can try and watch some YouTube videos and stuff like that, but until you actually get behind a fader and have to decide how loud the vocal is going to be or how it's processed or how it fits in with all the other instruments, it can be daunting. I was just talking to somebody the other day who had an instrumental track and they were trying to mix the vocal into the an already done instrumental track and how hard that was for them to get that level right. And it just, it just goes to show you that even the simplest things can take practice and, and that goes for anything. So I would just say, love what you do and practice and practice and practice and fail. That makes me think of another thing too, which is um, to just do what you are, you know, like there, there's always this, this saying that they talk about, you know, write what you know, it's kind of like a like an addendum to that is like I feel like as a player as a musician I think sometimes it's more important to be yourself than it is to be good sometimes I mean practice is so important but the x factor I think is also kind of being yourself you know I was scared of that meeting that I had with my uh, manager when he said you you kind of used to ramble more why don't you ramble again and I was like oh cuz I was scared of that I thought people didn't like that. That was honest to me. That's a natural way of writing for me. And I was terrified of doing it again. I thought people wouldn't like it. And then, of course, you know, Other Side is a very well-received song. And it, it's pretty rambly. And that's kind of just, yeah, like I said, it's me. And so don't subvert yourself so much, even if you're scared of it or you think you're not the thing or whatever. Like, like don't let practice iron that out of you. You can still, it should be a partner to whatever you are innately, you know, instead of replacing it. Yeah. It's been so great talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks yeah. so much. Thank you, John. Cheers. It's been brilliant to have you on Tape Notes. Um, we should have one more piece of music, and like an outro piece from the album um, that we could play a bit of now. Um, what, what would you like to go for? Mm. <laughs> I'd love to do uh, What a Time to Be Alive because that was such a, that was another one of those true. I would love to talk about that one if we had time, but we don't. So, but we can just hear it. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thanks again, Neil. Yep. Patrick, brilliant to talk to you. Cheers. And this is Fallout Boy with What a Time to Be Alive. Thank you for listening, and in particular, thanks to all of you who have signed up to support us on Patreon. I'm just one part of the team that brings you Take Notes, and it relies on your support. Access to Patreon includes the full-length videos of new episodes where possible, ad-free episodes, and detailed gear lists, among many other things. If you'd like to join, head to the link on our socials or website. For pictures, highlight clips, and behind-the-scenes content, head to our Instagram or YouTube channel. And on Discord, you can join the growing Take Notes community. Once again, thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye.